Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content for the Davis Finney Foundation and I'm excited to be here today with Drs. Boss Bloom and Dr. Siran Dar Darwish. Is that correct? Did I say it correctly? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. We are going to talk about the slow speed study. Uh, so we'll get into that. But first, I'd love um, Dr. Bloom, if you can share with us, our community, who you are, uh, how you, you're in your work with the Parkinson's um, community, and then also this study in particular. Sure. Uh, well, that's a long question. Um, uh, so my name is Bas Bloom. I'm a professor of neurology. I'm leading one of the largest movement disorder centers in the world at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. As some people call it Holland. And we are very active in Parkinson research, but with a particular emphasis on exercise. Uh, I'm a former semi-professional athlete myself. I used to play for the Dutch national volleyball team under 18. Uh, I played in the Dutch Premier League, the highest national level for several years. And so I'm now combining my two passions, which is sports, and I'm, I'm a believer in the health benefits of sports and helping people with Parkinson's. And now we bring them together in the slow speed study, which is one of the most exciting studies that's going to take place in the Parkinson field in the coming years. Um, we've all spent, and we need to continue to spend a lot of time and energy in supporting people who already have the disease. And I know the Davis Finney Foundation is a champion for people with Parkinson's today. At the same time, what we're seeing is that Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological condition in the world. It's growing faster than Alzheimer's, faster than any other neurological disease. So we need to somehow find ways of uh, stopping this Parkinson pandemic, as we've called it, from taking place. There are lots of drugs being explored now for the possibility to postpone or possibly even prevent Parkinson's disease. Um, but so far to no prevail. And if you look at all the interventions in the world that could possibly have a disease modifying effect, slowing progression in those who already have the disease, preventing it in those at risk, it's exercise. And the evidence for this is quite compelling. A number of studies have shown that people who regularly exercise during life have a lower risk of developing the disease. We have studies partially funded by the Davis Finney Foundation in our own center to show that engaging in regular exercise helps to stabilize your motor symptoms. Whereas if you don't exercise, your symptoms will worsen over time. And we have a very, very cool study came out earlier this year to show that exercising for 30 minutes at 80% of your maximum workout three times a week allows for the brain to make new functional connections. I mean, how cool is that? If, you're, if you've got Parkinson's, you're on the treadmill, you're on your stationary bicycle, and you think, my brain is making new functional connections. So that's wonderful news and important news for those who already have Parkinson's today. We now want to take that evidence to those at risk of developing Parkinson's to see whether engaging in regular exercise helps to postpone the time of conversion to fully manifest Parkinson's and who knows to prevent it altogether. Great, thank you. So one interesting thing that st stood out for me, I hadn't heard anybody say this yet, but um, that Parkinson's is, is growing at a more rapid rate than Alzheimer's. Um, is there any speculation as to wh why that is? Is it is it because there's more environmental factors for, for Parkinson's or? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of factors. Um, one is obviously aging. Um, um, so aging explains why Alzheimer's is more common, um, uh, why Parkinson's is more common these days and will become more common. But if you correct for aging, Alzheimer's remains more or less the same. In other words, the growth in Alzheimer's is fully explained by the aging effect. And in one large study published in The Lancet, the one and only disease, neurological disease, that kept growing over and above the aging effect was Parkinson's. It's not because we are better at diagnosing Parkinson's, because we do this today, just as James Parkinson did in 1817, by just listening to people and doing a good neurological exam. It's not like we have better diagnostic tests. 
Parkinson's is still a diagnosis made with your bare hands. Um, so we strongly feel that the environment plays a major role. Uh, James Parkinson described the disease in 1817 for the first time in London when the Industrial Revolution was taking place. And we now know that air pollution is one of the factors contributing to Parkinson's. But since World War II, we are now using an increasing amount of pesticides across the globe to feed a fast growing worldwide population. And many of those pesticides have been linked to a higher risk of Parkinson's in farmers, those living in the vicinity of farmland. And ultimately it's possible that all of us are at risk because these pesticides reach the food chain. Uh, French wines, for example, contain multiple, even up to 17 different pesticides. And this is a major concern. It also means Parkinson's is potentially a preventable disease if we would sanitize our environment. So this is another sort of major effort that Sirwan and I are both involved in. Okay, thank you so much. That's great. Um, Dr. Darwish, uh, what is your role in the speed slow, uh, sorry, slow speed study and in Parkinson's in general? Um, my role is that I'm the PI of, uh, of the slow speed study. Um, I'm a clinician epidemiologist. I work at the Parkinson Center, which is part of Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen. And, uh, and Bas is, um, is the chair of our center. And at, at the center, I have a dual role. On the one hand, I see patients, many of whom have clinically manifest Parkinson's. On the other hand, I supervise a research group of nine PhD students um, uh, a few postdocs, various students, and many research assistants. Um, and our endeavors are, are directly targeted at uh, understanding the very early phase of Parkinson's before we see people in the clinic. Um, that phase is generally known as the prodromal phase. Um, and it's been a particular interest of mine uh, for close to 10 years now. Um, I have a PhD uh, on the epidemiology of Parkinson's with a particular focus on that prodromal phase. Um, uh, and I've been fortunate to work with various leaders in the field, first at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, then at Harvard, the Harvard School of Public Health in the United States, and now for approximately five and a half years as part of uh, the Parkinson Center in Nijmegen, uh, where we have an inspiring team um, uh, all working towards uh, possible solutions, uh, both for people who are who already have manifest Parkinson's, as well as those who are most likely in the prodromal phase of the disease. Okay, great. So can you tell us a little bit about what the slow speed study is, uh, sort of the aims of it, the goals of it, but also can you explain for people who are just uh, sort of new to the term, what is prodromal? And then, and how are you able to determine that this is a group of people that are likely to get Parkinson's? Sure. So um, the pathological processes of Parkinson's most likely start at least 10 years before people are clinically diagnosed. In fact, um, pathology is generally so advanced that approximately 70% of the most relevant brain cells. Those are dopaminergic neurons in the uh, substantia nigra are already depleted by the time that we're able to diagnose people with manifest Parkinson's. Um, and in those years before we can diagnose individuals, uh, but during which pathology is already present and spreading, uh, people go through the so-called prodromal phase. Um, and while people don't have the fully overt, um, um, have a fully overt manifestation of the disease yet, they do often experience subtle signs and symptoms, um, such as um, autonomic nervous um, uh, signs, uh, you can think of heart rate variability, um, but also signs of anxiety, um, depressive symptoms, um, subtle cognitive deficits, obstipation, uh, sorry, constipation uh, or loss of smell. And then often in the last five years before clinical diagnosis, most people with Parkinson's um, uh, first experience subtle motor signs, such as a mild tremor, for instance. So that's the prodromal phase of the disease. 
and it's at heart in the slow speed trial um, where we're aiming to recruit various people uh, who are currently in the prodromal phase of Parkinson's um, and, um, uh, and administer an exercise intervention to those individuals. Now, okay. broad strokes, um, we'll select people with from complementary risk strata, meaning either individuals who have a combination of prodromal features of Parkinson's or individuals who have a genetic predisposition to develop Parkinson's. Um, and the treatment will consist of um, a fully remotely administered uh, exercise program, which will administer through a smartphone app on participants' own smartphone, and will uh, will measure the effects of the intervention uh, using the very same smartphone as well as a smartwatch, such okay. as what I'm wearing today. Okay. Great. Uh, Dr. Blom, can you explain what exactly the intervention is? Um, is this related to the paper that you were just talking about? That's like the three days a week, 30 minutes. Uh, what is what is the expectation that everybody has to do? Um, how many participants? And then how long is the commitment to this study? Right. Again, many, many layers in your question. Um, our, the study that I refer to was a home-based study where people were given a stationary bicycle in their homes and they were asked to exercise on that stationary bicycle for 30 minutes, three times a week. Now that was a beautiful and important study, uh, but the, the downside was it, it's not very scalable. If you ultimately want to prevent the Parkinson pandemic, you need to develop an intervention that can potentially go to Africa, to Brazil, to China, uh, to other underserved areas of the world. Um, so we wanted this to be a fully home-based, remotely delivered study uh, that would be scalable to other countries, which is why we developed uh, an intervention on the participant's own smartphone as a service to the individuals. Um, and basically what the smartphone is doing, it's encouraging people to walk more, so to increase the volume of their activities in simple layman's terms, taking 10,000 steps per day is better than taking 5,000 steps per day, and which a number of studies have shown is an independent predictor of health in Parkinson patients. But the second component is the intensity of the movements to walk more briskly or to climb the stairs you know, just a little bit faster. And we will monitor the actual compliance with these instructions through a smart watch, which can nicely measure heart rate, but also the skin impedance which people may know as a lie detector, the more you start to sweat, the lower the impedance of the skin. So if people start to sweat a little bit and their heart rate goes up, we know they're working out a bit more intensely. So it's a mixture of enhancing the volume, taking more steps, but also increasing the, the vigor of the activities. Um, so no one's gonna be able to say, no, no, I worked out really hard. And they're like, well, it didn't show up. Big, big boss is watching you, so. <laughs> Um, and uh, given that this is a study in people who may take a long time to ultimately develop Parkinson's, and Dr. Darwish was already talking about 10, maybe 20, perhaps even 30 years, these will be long-term intervention studies. But our initial idea is to deliver this intervention for at least three years, um, which may not be enough to see a full conversion to the moment when a doctor diagnoses Parkinson's, but we think this is enough to see a change in volume of the early prodromal features, these early subtle signs that Parkinson's is on the brink of happening. And we hope to show that the growth in the number and severity of those subtle symptoms will grow slower in those exercising regularly compared to those who are more sedentary. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure, uh, maybe this is for you, um, Dr. Darwish, the, when you're looking at the people that are in, in this uh, prodermal um, part of their life, and you, are there certain sort of bright lines that you're saying, oh, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to evaluate, you know, thousands of these thousands of people, and then we have some bright lines around anxiety, sleep behavior, all of these things that tell us like, oh, there's a very good chance they're going to develop it. Because I guess it's such a, it's difficult, right? It's such a long study. 
how do you know that this is preventing yeah. Parkinson's the, from forming it, or would they never have gotten Parkinson's anyway, right? You're, you're absolutely right. That's a key challenge. Um, the short answer is there's no way of knowing definitively. Um, the somewhat more nuanced answer is um, by combining the uh, progression of multiple prodromal features, um, you do get a grasp and, um, and your predictive accuracy increases considerably. So an individual who develops um, progressive smell loss over time, which is a key prodromal feature of Parkinson's, and who also develops constipation in a progressive manner over time, as well as subtle motor features and uh, subtle cognitive features, is far more likely to phenoconvert to fully manifest Parkinson's than is an individual who has a single prodromal feature that does not progress over time. Mm -hmm. um, and we feel fortunate to have a strong uh, multidisciplinary research team, not only at Radboud, but also at our collaborating institutions, such as Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard, and Rochester University, um, where, uh, which allows us to capitalize on the expertise of each of these groups to interpret the progression in prodromal um, symptoms um, uh, as accurately as we can. Okay, thanks. Um, Dr. Bloom, so uh, this leads me to say like, where, how are you recruiting or finding these people? And then what role does 23andMe play in this? So 23andMe plays an important role. Um, so just for the folks who don't really know what 23andMe is, this is a, a company where you can send your blood sample and they will analyze your ancestry. So you can find out that you actually happen to have 10% of Icelandic blood, or maybe you're secretly half African or who knows. But you can also tick a box and say, I want to hear about my genetic risks. So hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have sent their blood and consented to have their genetic risk disclosed. And lo and behold, a couple of thousand of individuals carry a mutation in a gene that conveys a significant risk of turning into Parkinson's disease. It's called the so-called LARC2 gene and the GBA gene. Um, we've already reached out to those thousands of individuals uh, to probe their global interest in this study. And, they, and, and there's two things that emerged or three things. One is many of those individuals were actually not aware that exercise is one way to help prevent this disease from happening, which I find incredible. Now, if I were to have this genetic time bomb in my brain, you know, I would, I would exercise just like Davis Finney is doing. Um, second thing is even those people who knew that exercise was good, didn't do it. Don't we all sign up with the gym on January 1st, only to quit exercising by the second week of January. So this is why this gamified intervention that we've developed is so important to make the exercise enjoyable and palatable and make people comply over long periods of time. Um, the good news is that many of those individuals who we've asked about their potential interest in the study said that they were actually interested. So those people sitting on the 23andMe database are part of our endeavor, uh, but knowing that genetic Parkinson's is not all of Parkinson's, we also want to reach out to non-genetic populations and these are people who already have the earliest symptoms of what, of what may later turn out to be Parkinson's. And one of the most important symptoms in this area is a REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out your dreams. Normally you're paralyzed when you're sleeping, except for your eyes, which is called rapid eye movements. And so we're going to reach out to sleep centers where these people are sitting and ask for their consent to also be randomized into a study of exercise, the slow speed study. Great. Do you, um, Dr. Darwish, how many people are you hoping to enroll in this study over the course of the next few years? 800 in total, 800. Um, spread over three countries. That's the United States, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. Um, but our ambition for long-term is much greater. Um, the elegant aspect of this study is that uh, that it could be scaled to any country where people have a smartphone um, and ideally also a smartwatch. 
Um, but even if individuals only had a smartphone, it would be possible to administer a remote uh, exercise program with encouragement uh, over a longer period of time. And it would also be possible to monitor the progression of prodromal features uh, to determine how likely it is that an individual progresses to manifest Parkinson's. So our ambition is clearly to scale to other countries as well, not only in, um, in Europe or North America, but also to Africa, South America, and parts of Asia uh, in the somewhat, uh, in, in the, mid, uh, in the mid, mid to long term. Okay, and so for the exercise, uh, prescription intervention that you're sharing, Dr. Darwish, it's, is it, it's no equipment. It's just, Hey, this is fully accessible to literally yeah. anybody, anybody that's, who can do stuff. That's absolutely right. Um, there are, I think there are two, two important considerations. Uh, previous studies, including those from our own group have shown that there uh, are two independent components of exercise that may slow the course of Parkinson's disease. The first is the intensity of exer exercise, meaning that individuals who engage in highly intense um, exercise regimens um, show subtle signs of disease slowing. Now, um, uh, as you notice, I'm quite careful in my phrasing here um, because as an epidemiologist, I'm by, by nature skeptical of any evidence I see, uh, but, but here the evidence is quite converging from different research lines, indicating that uh, exercise may slow the progression of Parkinson's and may also induce comp uh, compensation mechanisms in the brain um, to compensate for, uh, for Parkinson's pathology. So the first component is the uh, intensity of exercise. The, the second component is the volume of exercise, meaning the more you engage in exercise, even at low intensity, um, the lower your risk of progression may be. Um, and quite recently, um, uh, several longitudinal studies have shown that people who engage in high volume exercise, even at low intensity, have a lower risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, and to us, that's, uh, that's a very relevant uh, observation um, because um, high volume exercise regimens can safely be administered outside of um, uh, outside of the outside of a research center, outside of any direct supervision, uh, and can be safely uh, administered to any individual across the world at risk of Parkinson's. And that will be the primary focus of the intervention in this study. So we'll primarily encourage individuals to increase the volume of their uh, physical activities, and in addition to that we will encourage participants um, to engage in moderate to vigorous uh, physical activities, but always in a safe setting. Yeah, I think that's such a big thing. I mean, gosh, our community is constantly asking how intense is enough intensity? Is it too much? Am I going to do too much? Is right. there such thing yeah. as too much exercise? And it yeah. sounds like yeah. um, in this case, volume can can um, not necessarily take the place of intensity, but if you are able to increase the volume, but not safely intensity, you're you're still using your time really well. You're absolutely exactly. right. Yeah, it's perfectly complimentary. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, okay, so um, any what are some of the biggest challenges um, aside from compliance that you see in this uh, study, Dr. Bloom? Well, there's a number of issues. Like I said, you know, it's a, it's a type of study, it's high risk, high reward. You know, imagine if we're successful, we're able to prevent Parkinson's. How, how wonderful would that be for all those folks in the world? Um, the, the, the risks are considerable. One challenge that's still not entirely resolved, but we think we can tackle it, is if you reach out to individuals who are still healthy today, uh, who may carry an increased risk of developing Parkinson's, and you now tell them, do you want to participate in a study to prevent Parkinson's? They may say, what? Parkinson's? But I'm healthy. So maybe you're making these people sick. At the same time, they do have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's, and you offer them an opportunity to participate in an endeavor to prevent Parkinson's. So the ethics of reaching out to an at-risk population is something we want to handle very carefully. 
Second, the long-term compliance. This is not a two-week intervention study. Uh, I said, you know, we, we think it should be at least three years, maybe longer, but we're very fortunate to be able to partner with, you know, the best gaming companies in the world to make this palatable, enjoyable, and engaging in the long term. This is why I've called it the Pokemon Go, you know, for Parkinson's. Pokemon Go has been around for years and people still play it because they keep developing new items and, and make it uh, uh, engaging. The third element is um, uh, we'll be able to measure Parkinson's remotely and reliably. Will people comply with remote measurements? Uh, part of our remote measurement is passive monitoring. That's the easy peasy part. But we also want to do a set of scheduled tasks. For example, holding out your phone in your stretched hand to see if it's, uh, if it's trembling, uh, to making alternating movements, and to complete a set of questionnaires. And that too depends on participants' ability and willingness to cooperate over, over time. So this is one huge learning experience to learn about the ethics, to learn about compliance issues, to be able to reach out to these populations remotely. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm confident with our wonderful team that Dr. Darwish mentioned that will pull it off. Yeah, when you say uh, reaching out to them, are you, is it, is it um, the app gonna sort of be push notifications where they're like, oh, uh, it pops up and you ask them a few questions or is it all, you know, individual base, they have to like go into the app to, to get that info. No, they will be triggered to, um, um, uh, to, to, to complete these questionnaires. And uh, of course you can hit postpone if it, if it doesn't suit mm -hmm. you well at that particular moment. But of course we need those uh, measurements from time to time. And again, because these individuals are healthy, right? Are yeah. they sufficiently motivated to, to comply over a long time and to spend some of their time on research. But this is why a larger part of our effort is rewarding people with knowledge. So the reward is not money. Uh, the reward is health, it's one. And the reward is also knowledge and insights. And, and I know this is close to the heart of the Davis Finney Foundation. You're doing a wonderful job in educating uh, uh, your followership, your, your members. And this is exactly what we're doing as part of the trial. Oh, that's great. So great. Uh, how, Dr. Darvish, how are, are the results going to be assessed and, and sort of what uh, what milestones do you have? So we're expecting the trial to, um, uh, to undergo a few um, uh, phases. First phase will be to include individuals in the Netherlands um, who are already known to our center um, who are relatively easy to recruit, um, uh, given the fact that there are very few logistical barriers in such a small country as the Netherlands. Um, uh, and, and we're hoping to learn some critical information that may inform the design of the further deployment um, of, the, of our exercise intervention app and of the trial as a whole in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Um, and concrete points that we're expecting to learn are what are facilitators and barriers to compliance of individuals in this study. Um, we're also hoping to further develop, so to continu continuously develop um, the smartphone uh, motivational app throughout the course of the study to keep people engaged. Um, and I think another learning point for us will be how people handle the ethical challenges that, uh, that Dr. Bloom just mentioned uh, over a longer period of time. This will be the first in its kind um, as a prevention trial of Parkinson's. Um, so I believe that the, the knowledge it generates will be, will be unique in several aspects. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bloom, is there anything that I haven't asked about the trial that uh, I should have asked? Maybe one question that I would ask if I were a member of the Davis Finney Foundation, wh why should the Davis Finney Foundation invest in Parkinson prevention studies? And since you didn't ask it, I'll raise the question. Uh, and I, I think people with Parkinson's today will also benefit from this effort. First of all, I think it's a worldwide responsibility to make every effort and make sure that no other person in the world will develop this disease in the future. 
but I can see how people already affected by Parkinson's today might say, well, why are you not investing extra time and energy in me to support me? And I can tell those people a large chunk of our efforts in my center and in many centers in the world is going into support for people with Parkinson's today and their families. But this trial, this slow speech study will learn us a great deal about remote trials, about remote measurements, about compliance issues, about whether or not volume or intensity is good for you. So a lot of the knowledge that we will obtain in this trial will trickle down to you as well. So I think this is hugely important. This study is one major learning experience, not just for prodromal, but for people with actual Parkinson's disease today as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can look at it and say, if, if, there, if there is an intervention that is so powerful that it can prevent it from actually happening, then what could it do for the people who already have it? It's just as powerful, right? I mean, we, we see Absolutely. people every day. The reason they're living well is because they're exercising every day. So that's, that is just the message that's not going to change no matter where you are on the spectrum. And you can say, well, this is not for people. This is for people before they have Parkinson's. What about me? Well, do you want your Parkinson's to not be the most awful thing in the world? Um, over time, you can kind of uh, mitigate a lot of your symptoms by exercising every day. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. That's great. And I do love, I, I just love this idea of looking at the intensity and volume combined, uh, because that is just such a, such a sticking point for a lot of uh, people in our community that are sort of scared of the intensity, but also let's be totally honest. We've got so many people with Parkinson's that were not exercised. They did not exercise in their life. This was not a thing for them. It was just not something they did. And then they get this diagnosis and we're like, oh, hey, by the way, you have to exercise every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's a really big ask, right? And if you don't have to say that everything has to be super highly intense um, and you can actually go for, go for a four or five mile walk instead of a, you know, crazy, you know, 30 minute bike ride or something like that, where you feel scared and out of breath and uncomfortable, um, then we might slowly be able to make that leap. Um, they That's start with volume different. and then they get more intense and then, you know, the, the benefits from that. It's absolutely right. And maybe I can just add one anecdote from my own experience, um, which is that a couple of years ago, I think two years ago now, our group published a, um, a widely cited paper in the Lancet Neurology which is, um, uh, which is the highest impact journal in our field, uh, showing that individuals who engaged in exercise three times a week um, show, um, uh, show slower progression um, than people who do not, than people who merely engage in stretching, people with manifest Parkinson's that is. Um, and in that particular trial, people, uh, people with Parkinson's were tasked to exercise on a home trainer. Um, and the week after the study was published um, and was widely uh, publicized across uh, popular media, um, I received uh, phone calls from 12 patients out of my outpatient clinic, all of whom had Parkinson's disease, who asked me where they should buy a um, home trainer. And my answer was, it's not, it's not the home trainers that matters, it's the exercise. Um, and what you just said, it, it's absolutely right. I mean, we see people with manifest Parkinson's every day. We realize how challenging it is. And we also realize that it's not, uh, it's not fe feasible to engage in all types of exercise, especially when you're in a, at an advanced stage of the disease. But whatever you can do uh, to engage in exercise is still beneficial. Um, so that includes low intensity, uh, but higher volume forms of exercise, such as walking. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, I know we were are very excited about this uh, study. That's why we were, I guess we can call us the first movers. Uh, as soon as we were. found yeah. out about it, we were like, we're in. We, we want to do this. So we're thrilled to be a part of it. And we're thrilled to be a part of this amazing team that you have working on this. Uh, so many great people are in, and organizations are involved. And we cannot wait to see how this uh, turns out over the next few years. And we hope to get 
back with you on lots of updates as they become available and uh, we will share this information far and wide. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you both for being here today to talk to us about it. Nobody in our community is ever sick of uh, talk about exercise. So they're gonna love this. And, and can I thank you, uh, the entire foundation and Davis Finney uh, himself and Connie, his wife, for your support and for your confidence. Uh, the Davis Finney Foundation, everybody listening today is, should be aware that you were the first mover. You were the first to roll up the sleeves and to believe in our approach. And as a first mover, you set the train in motion. And it might well be that slow speed would never have existed without the Davis Finney Foundation. I'm very thankful for that. Well, we're, we couldn't be more grateful to, to be able to work with people like you. So thank you so much. Thank you.